And without further ado, the speaker is uh, Matthew Rocklin, who will be speaking about Dask in production. So thank you very much, Matt. Hi, everyone. My name is Matt. Uh, from like a thousand sci-fi talks in the past, most of them about Dask. Uh, this talk is on Dask in production. Quick show of hands, who has used Dask before at some point? Lots of people. Who has used Dask on a more than one machine at once, on like a cluster of machines? Maybe half as many people. Who, has you, who is using Dask right now while you're in this talk? Because there's some automated system running. I'm counting four or five people. Yeah, there's this big gap between Dask and also just Python generally. We're commonly used for sort of interactive stuff, for analysis stuff. We're less commonly used for business critical production applications. Uh, in Dask, so I've worked on Dask for 10 and a half years now. About halfway through that journey, we found that mostly we were just spending time helping people set up Dask clusters. That was a big challenge. Eventually, I and others started a company called Coiled, which sets up Dask for you in the cloud. So it's a for-profit company. It's like a Databricks kind of SaaS product, uh, but very much focused around the Dask open source project. A lot of the Dask developers work there now. And we help lots of companies run Dask in the cloud. I actually don't want to talk too much about the Coiled product. I want to talk more about what we've learned running Dask jobs for a bunch of people uh, all the time. Uh, I checked just before we were talking this talk. There are 19 people, there are 19 Dask clusters that we're serving currently. And we are tracking metrics on all of them. And we've been doing that for the last year or two. And so we actually have a lot of interesting data. And so it's not just lessons of learning, lessons learned from running Dask in production, but of running roughly a million Dask clusters or roughly 10 billion Python functions. Uh, and we've, we've collected metrics during all that process. So we have an interesting data set and also like a lot of scar tissue. And so part of this talk is going to be me sharing some interesting data, and part of it is gonna be me complaining a lot about scar tissue, and hopefully that'll be fun. Uh, so uh, the lessons learned, I'm just gonna, here's some things we're gonna talk through. Metrics are good, it'll be really fun to look through some of these metrics together, I think. Kubernetes is not always the right tool, that was a, a hard learning for us. Uh, and there's also some other things about sort of cloud infrastructure. ARM, uh, scalability, how much people scale or don't scale, and there's other things that are there. I'm getting mild feedback is that you're working on it. Thanks, cool, thank you. Um, so this talk is just gonna be a weird collection of fun facts that we have learned in the last couple of years. Um, hopefully it'll be fun for you, as fun as it is for me. But first, very quickly, what is Dask? You all already raised your hands, you've already seen this already, so I'm not gonna go into that much. But Dask is a library for parallel computing, it does lots of different stuff. It does pandas stuff, it does x-ray stuff, it does generic wacky Python stuff. Um, uh, I usually give demos like this with DAS data frame, super simple stuff. In reality, it looks more like this. This is the actual DAS data frame code people see in practice. Um, if you wanna see more code like this, uh, my colleague James is looking at DAS data frame is fast now to talk at 2.30 today where he goes through a lot of performance work that's been going on recently. But there's a whole section of DAS that just looks like uh, beating Spark because it's sort of easier and faster. There's a whole other group of Dask users who are mostly thinking about just generic for loops. I got a thousand files in the cloud, I wanna run some custom function on those, on those files, how do I do that in parallel? Or I've got some really wacky Python code that I wanna parallelize in some way. This is more commonly found in like a hedge fund with some custom training, training strategy. So totally different use case of Dask, not big pandas, not big X-ray, just help me parallelize my wacky Python script. And then also there's the sort of big NumPy, big X-Array use case, more common in this community because of X-Array. I think X-Array, raise your hands if you use X-Array. Yeah, so that's like half of the hands. So uh, Dask, I think maybe one of the very few software projects that scales out a multi-dimensional array model. And that's an interesting use case in this space. Um, as a result, Dask can do things like this. So this was the national water model. Uh, it's a 250 terabyte data set that we processed in the cloud for about 20 bucks. Uh, and the fact that this is possible, is new, is fun. Uh, I can show this video, and I'm gonna actually open up the data set in a minute. But again, getting that actually up and running and fast is actually quite hard to do in a, in a real production way. So, very brief demo. Uh, I'm gonna look at that data set. Let's bump up the screen resolution a tiny bit. 
another tiny bit. Here is a big ZAR file sitting on S3. I could process this with my laptop very, 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 very slowly. It is 250 terabytes. It would take a couple of years to download. Uh, so I won't do that. Instead, I'm going to ask for some machines in the cloud. This is like the very brief coiled pitch. I apologize, putting on my for-profit hat. I'm going to want 100 machines in the region where that data lives. Let's ask for some fun architecture, too. Let's ask ARM. Let's ask for there's spot available. Let's use it. And there's not full thought available. Uh, let's fall back to on demand. These are just some, some hardware configurations I might want to sort of reduce costs. So I'm going to get those machines. Those will show up in about a minute. In the meantime, I'm going to sort of vamp for what's happening. Uh, I haven't specified a Docker image. So the first thing that's happening is I'm actually scraping my MacBook here on, in, in my, this MacBook in this conference for the right version of X-Ray, right version of Dask, right version of Python. And all of that configuration is going up to the cloud. Uh, then I'm going to provision 100 machines. So I've got six machines. I've got 37 machines. I've got 87 machines. And they're now booting. They're like turning on Ubuntu. They're turning on. So we are going from no cloud infrastructure has been deployed to a DAS cluster in about a minute. And that DAS cluster will have exactly the configuration and the credentials that my laptop has. Um, this is, I think, what I'm going to sort of talk through a little bit. How do we get these things running? Because it's pretty powerful once you have all this stuff going. And you can summon a fleet of machines to do your bidding in a moment's notice from anywhere that you run Python. That is, that is atypical from other, from other systems. They're booting. I'm now like stressed because they're taking a minute to boot. But in roughly 30 seconds, they'll be finished. Uh, let's go while we're waiting. I'm going to take a look at what's going on. Yeah, so we can see that they sort of all got queued. They took you know, 10 seconds to, to provision. It looks like some of them are coming on. So they're now downloading packages. They're downloading, again, X-Array, NumPy, Pandas, as fast as humanly possible. We've like tweaked out Conda, Mamba, Pixie, et cetera, to download things as quickly as we possibly can, far faster than you can download a Docker image. Um, and then, you know, there's one that's still booting. But in 10 seconds, we'll be ready to go. So I've got a vamp. Anyone have any fun DAS jokes? I have like 1,000 workers here. No one's doing any, any DAS jokes. OK. So uh, and we're good to go. We've got a DAS cluster. And let's go ahead and do a computation. I'm not going to process the full quarter petabyte, because that would take a little bit of time with 100 workers. But we'll get just sort of like six terabytes. And so X-Array is doing its thing. DAS Array is doing its thing. It's breaking down this very simple query into a couple hundred thousand tasks. And those are now running on my 100 machines. You've seen a DAS demo before, so you know that the upper right chart here, every line corresponds to one core in a cluster. It's running on the cloud. And every rectangle corresponds to one Python function. I mentioned that we've been managing around 10 billion Python function evaluations this year. We're now adding another 100,000 to that number. So that's what's happening now. Anyway, this is a basic DAS demo. What's novel here is that we went from having nothing to having a fully running DAS cluster in about a minute that was fully configured for us. And that's, that's a convenient power to have to deploy to lots of different groups. So basic stats, we're not huge. We're not like wildly successful as a company. We have around 100, 200 weekly active users, billions of function calls. We manage mil millions of VMs. Again, I mentioned when I first started the, the, for the conference, I was writing slides, as we all do. And there are about, about 19 active people. So that's sort of the like the sort of flow of activity we've got today. You could be one of those people. And if you wanted to pay us money, it'd be great. Um, okay. So cool makes it easy to run Python. It also makes it easy to measure Python. So a lot of this is going to be about measurement. So let's go back to that dashboard page. And we've got Python code here. We've also got hardware metrics. And we've got things like, you know, how many workers could Dask have used? How active was the gill at the time? Uh, how active were the CPUs at the time? There's like plenty of information that we have here that's actually pretty interesting. And again, we're running on thousands and thousands of clusters being run every day uh, that sort of we aggregate over time. So let's take a look at some of that data. Uh, so let's ask a question about the gill. 
Many people today complain about the gill, and I always say, don't worry about the gill. We've released the gill in all the packages. Not a thing to worry about. So again, this is from a larger workload, uh, and the bottom chart here is showing gill contention. I'm zooming in here. Bottom chart is showing gill contention for that workload over time. And there's a wide variability of gill activity, but it's at, it, the blue line here is about 25% most of the time. The gill is actually usually not a bottleneck for this fairly heavy workload. We're fine. Uh, this is typical, so across the last sort of 500 clusters that have run on coiled, uh, looks like, I don't know, 90% of them are within that sort of 20, 30% range. There are a few that are pretty active. So again, this is cool. We're actually in a position now where we can observe lots of Python code running at scale and start to make some decisions at sort of an ecosystem level. Uh, to show an example of that, we had a different set of users, set of workloads, that were much, much worse. So it gets much, much higher, much, much earlier on. And that, we then could go look, go look at the code. We can encourage some different behaviors, maybe switch to small VMs rather than big VMs. Uh, we can also look at the code and see, oh, actually, we haven't released the gill in pandas. This actually, this data caused us to go find a problem in pandas and fix it upstream. There was a bit of pandas where we needed to call a no gill block that we didn't. So this is, again, sort of this, sort of, this really nice feedback loop of tracking lots and lots and lots and lots of Python code being executed, understanding the code that's happening at the same time, and being able to act on that code in the ecosystem. And that's a very fun feedback loop we're sort of playing with now that's, I think, exciting. It's exciting to me. So data makes good decisions easy. We all sort of know that. And we're sort of in a fun position to play with that. So I'm going to talk briefly about how to build cloud infrastructure, about how the choices that we've made uh, that I think have been useful. Sorry. <coughs> I flew in from Montreal like at 2 a.m. last night, so it's a, it's a rough day for me. Um, so how do we lose cloud infrastructure? Um, my experience when I first started doing these sorts of systems, when I was working at Anaconda or at NVIDIA, I would set up DAS clusters for lots of different companies manually. And I set up Kubernetes. And I would create a Kubernetes cluster in my cloud account. I would set up Jupyter. I would set up DAS, DAS Kubernetes, DAS Gateway, and have some node pool there. This was an amazing demo. I've given this demo a few times at SciPy conference and other conferences. It looks really slick. I hate it now. I still, I run into people who are giving me like my slides uh, for platforms that they're running that like inspired the thing that I did. Please, this is like, this doesn't work. I will, I will propose to you why this isn't gonna work. So first, everything seems super easy. Then someone asks, hey, can I have some different hardware? I want more hardware flexibility. Can I have some GPUs? I want a big memory machine. I want some SSDs. And say, great, I will like, figure out how to make more node pools beneath Kubernetes. I'll write a bunch of YAML to make it easy to sort of select those node pools with the right selectors. No sweat. I know how to use Kubernetes. I can write some YAML. I'm great. Then they say, well, actually, I work at a company, so I can't use your Kubernetes cluster. I can run this inside of some, my own cloud account. No sweat again. I can just duplicate the Kubernetes system in some other company, so Kubernetes is intended for. Maybe I've got to switch the like, node pools around, switch around VPCs or some configuration, but this can work. Then they say, actually, I have two different regions my data is in. Can you make for me not one new Kubernetes cluster, but two new Kubernetes clusters? And very quickly, you start building all these different Kubernetes clusters, all these different node pools to handle all these different situations. This gets worse as they start asking you, hey, can I update scikit-learn in just this particular version? Um, and there's a lot of heterogeneity that comes up. We all are very heterogeneous. We like very different things. Uh, and trying to create some, some common ground is quite hard for us to do. So you want to add regular jobs, you add prefect, you want to like add people, control the usage, you add users, you add a user database, it all gets very messy. IT doesn't like it, users don't like it, it's very sad. Uh, what we do today is very different. Uh, we have a, user, have a database and we have a web application sitting in our own cloud account. People show up with their cloud account and they give us credentials to operate inside of theirs. And we spin up resources in their cloud accounts, not using Kubernetes, just using raw VMs. We use like the EC2 instance, that is our unit of, of operation. And that we found has been extremely powerful for a few reasons. We then turn everything off when they're done, and it's very, very cheap. So we call this the raw cloud architecture. Most systems have layers and layers and layers of stack. We do not. We just like have raw EC2 instances and basic networking. 
This is kind of an atypical approach. We found it's actually very, very powerful, very clean for a few reasons. Nothing is running at rest, so it's cheap. You can use any hardware, any instance type on any region in any account, all within a minute. If you want a GPU running in Saudi Arabia in your cloud account, we can run that and see that set up in a minute. The, like, the flexibility there is, is pretty incredible. Um, we also work pretty hard to make the VMs we spin up look exactly like your laptop. And so there's, there's pretty good um, transportability of everything. It's also to get into brutally cheap. So uh, you need to pair it with a web app, with database and web app, which we do. So I'm going to pa skip past this time. So let's, uh, and so what that gives us is again this mechanism that we saw earlier where I type in the architecture that I want into my Python environment anywhere in Python, uh, and then we get that same architecture running within a minute wherever we want it to. So this is cool because it's infrastructure defined in Python, and it's any infrastructure. It's fully flexible. Um, this is, again, quite different from the systems that I've seen built in the past. So what that gives us is actually some very interesting capabilities. It allows us to play around a lot with sort of our code and hardware and how we sort of make decisions. So I want to get into those things. This is going to leave architecture and get back into data a bit. So I can run some Python code, and I can choose to run it on an instance type with any software stack. And that's, that's a neat thing to play with. So for example, um, let's think about ARM. So ARM instances on most clouds are cheaper. On AWS, there's a Graviton instance type. It costs four cents per CPU hour, roughly, rather than five cents per CPU hour. It also runs about your code about 5% faster in our benchmarks across a wide variety of use cases. In general, it's a good thing to do. The challenge is that people aren't sure about ARM. They don't know that their code is going to compile, that it's going to run. We, uh, and so what happens is they, they tend to just run Intel chips all the time. Intel is the default. It's what people tend to use. Everyone trusts Intel chips. We actually know everyone's software environments because we're installing it for them. And we have run solves on what we've seen people run. And like 90%, 95% of workloads that we're seeing could be run on ARM. Like it is time for this community to switch defaults away from Intel to ARM. I apologize, Intel folks, if you're in the room. But like ARM is out competing you. And in the Python, scientific Python stack, there are very few cases where you can't use ARM chips. If you're like, we've got customers doing like geophysical inversions that require MKL. And if you're like doing MKL, yes, use Intel. If you're like not using MKL, switch to ARM. It's like better, faster, cheaper. There's more availability. The spot availability is nicer as well. We're probably just going to make this decision by default for users. We're going to like do both solves. If ARM works, we'll just switch to ARM for people automatically. Another fun fact, scaling is underused. So another chart in this chart of metrics is what Dask thinks you can use. How many machines can currently can your workload use? Dask has an understanding of that. In this workload, the user asked for about 600. They only got 500 because their quota was pretty, pretty limited. But Dask said, I can use 10,000. You can give me 10,000 machines, and I can use them efficiently in this calculation. Please give me more. This is pretty typical. What we actually find, I think, is that people are pretty hesitant to scale up because they think that scaling up is expensive. And it's not. Scaling up is actually pretty cheap. Oh, no. Video is not showing up. Um, what this chart would show you is that most jobs that we run are actually like in the pennies. Um, yeah, well, let's, let's just move on past that. If you do some math, uh, if you are mostly bound by S3 bandwidth, which almost all workloads that we see are, you can get a one core ARM chip on spot for about two cents per hour. Um, what that means that, that one core ARM chip of one instance can download about 60 megabytes per second. If you set that ARM chip to download and process a terabyte of data, it would take about five hours and cost you about 10 cents. And so this is actually the like, benchmark of cost that we've seen. You can process, if you're doing sort of normal processing, not like deep learning, training on LLM, but just like normal, what most people here do, you can process about a terabyte at about 10 cents. And that's actually a limit that we often see advanced users get up to. It actually is the limit that we saw in this video. If you look at the upper left, you'll see we're hitting 100 terabytes in $10. We're hitting 200 terabytes in $20. So this is about the cost of the cloud. 
if you're doing sort of basic data processing. People are wary of cloud costs, mostly because they're misusing the cloud. We see people just like leaving big VMs on all the time, and that's super expensive. But if you're using the cloud well, it's actually quite cheap. Another thing to use well is spot or preemptible instances. Again, in theory, everyone like should be using this, but they don't. Um, turns out in order to use it well, you actually need a couple of, of tricks. Um, uh, so we actually took our, like, and the internal DAS team has benchmarks that run all the time, and they get pretty expensive. We said, okay, guys, time to run on spot. We switched, we switched them over to spot, and they rebelled because their benchmarks started getting very noisy, things started failing. There was a lot of variability that was added into the system. They didn't like it. And so the, the business cost of variability wasn't outweighed by the, the, cl the cloud computing cost reduction. We changed two things. One, we looked at different availability zones. Each region in the cloud has different data centers, different, different like physical data centers. Different physical data centers have different amounts of spot or amounts of GPU. And it's good to be able to pick the data center with the most spot. It actually is quite, quite powerful. So that was the change number one we made. And this just shows you like over time what happened. Uh, different data centers are different times more active than others. Also, a lot of people ask for like 1,000 machines, and they only get 700 because that's like what's available at the time. And so we will we'll fill in with on-demand instances. With those two changes, suddenly Spot becomes something that we can do by default for most users. So again, this is like a 50% cost decrease. There's like a lot of cost decreases once you understand the cloud well. Uh, another fun thing that I learned, uh, if you look at just like the number of machines in a cluster, in a DAS cluster that's deployed in the cloud, I was expecting it to look something like this. It doesn't look like this. It looks different. And it looks different like this. There were many, many, many single machine DAS clusters. What people were doing is they were using coil, it's so easy to get a VM with coiled, that they're using coil to spin up a single machine DAS cluster, use DAS to run a single function on that cluster, and then tear down the cluster. They're using this like AWS batch or AWS Lambda. Um, and so people in the company said like, oh, let's just like make a little decorator. Let's like make this uh, an API that's nicer. I thought this was dumb because surely someone has done this before they haven't. Like the, the, the systems to run this are actually pretty terrible on the cloud. They're just like, give me a VM and run a function to turn it off. Um, yeah, I'll move past that for, yeah, gotcha. Um, actually, I'm gonna, this, is, this will be fun. So let's go to ChatGPT. Um, and let's ask ChatGPT, I have 1,000 files on S3 and a custom Python function. How can I, whoops, run that function on all of the files? with AWS services. And you would think this would be easy, but like ChatGPT is gonna go on here for a while. Um, got a function, cool, that makes a lot of sense. Make a Lambda function, cool. We're, I don't know, I actually don't know how the Boto stuff works that well. I've got a set of, of key. I would like to define a state machine definition to run this. Like this is well beyond the like complexity that a standard person can manage. The, like using the AWS service is not actually designed for, for, this, for this user community, for scientists. Um, so that's pain. What else do we got? Let's see, do I have, let me choose what's in here. Yeah, so yeah, I'll move past this. So in summary, uh, hardware, Flexibility is really important in the cloud, and using it well like, is pretty transformative. Getting good metrics and good data is actually really helpful to make fun, useful decisions. Uh, we think the combination of understanding Python code and like, deep metrics into what that code is doing and sort of full hardware flexibility, we found it's been very, very transformative. Uh, both because products move a lot faster. We've seen projects that have like, stalled for a year, move in a week, and also because there's like, a huge amount of cost reduction. Not because Dask is faster than Spark or anything, but just because people like leave Databricks clusters on for days because they're so awkward to turn on and off. Um, there's like a lot of misuse in the cloud, which generates a lot of cost. What we found is that with like a nuanced understanding of how Python and cloud work together, we can make a system that's like both easy and very, very cheap. Um, and that's been fun. So that's it. Uh, that's it. So if you want to learn more, 
There's das.org or cool.io. Uh, yeah, any questions are welcome. All right. Uh, Hello? Okay, I am. I can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, we have a bunch of questions, but most importantly, uh, there was a joke. Um, Kevin, yes. uh, are Dask jokes when you get 100 dads to tell jokes at the same time? So I'll take it. It's like dad jokes, but better. Yeah, that's right. Um, OK, so uh, let's think. Uh, doesn't it get quite, uh, so Patty asked, doesn't it get quite expensive with that many EC2 instances compared to a more lightweight server? So I suppose this is with regard to uh, what you were saying as opposed to getting rid of Kubernetes. Yeah, no, so I mean, if your server's on the cloud, then no, it's the same exact technology. What we often find is that people have just like big VMs they leave on for their scientists, their researchers, and the researchers log into that and screw around and do their work, and the big VM stays on. If you take a 128 core VM and leave it on 24 seven for a year, it costs 20 grand, 30 grand, 40 grand. Uh, like the cost is, is incredibly cheap, much more cheaper if you turn the VM off. And that's mostly what we're saying. We're saying turn computers off when you're not using them. And that's really easy if they, it's easy to come bring them back up. Okay, no, thank you. Uh, let's see, here's another one from uh, Gordon. Uh, the part that takes your local environment, versions of X-ray, pandas, et cetera, and installs the environment remotely, that is something that would be useful generally for DAS cluster usage. Uh -huh. <laughs> is the code for that available in a way that can be used outside of your coiled cluster? Absolutely not, no. I want money, so come use it on coiled. Uh, very fair question. I think NVIDIA, Anaconda, and like many other companies have asked us for that exact same thing. But no, it's a great, people love that thing. We're keeping it. I love open source, but like I also have to pay people. Yeah. Hopefully you don't mind. Yeah, fair enough. Um, uh, do you have, uh, from Josh Borrow, do you have any plans to use UV in the future over PIP? Yeah, we do, actually. That's why things are fast. Yeah, so do like people like the environment synchronization thing, the thing that like, scrapes up all of your packages and like deploys them on the cloud within 10 seconds. That's like, that's crazy tech. Uh, I think we're like talking to Wolf at Pixie. People should go talk to Wolf at Pixie at some point. But there's like lots of things that we do that are cutting edge. Um, yeah. Excellent. Um, so from Alan, uh, when you talked about raw cloud architecture as your preferred way to work, this is how using the cloud was several years ago. <laughs> it seems like every year a new layer is added for cloud computing, and as someone who just wants to use the cloud to do some computational work, this is all too burdensome or costly. How might someone convince cloud architects or uh, IT that all those layers aren't necessary? Yes. I <laughs> I edited your question slightly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the answer is yes. I don't know, you give a talk at SciPy with, with this diagram? I don't know, That's, I'm trying to do that. Let me know if I've succeeded. Okay. What else you got? Um, uh, I guess, okay, there was something about uh, ARM here as well. Um, yeah. ARM is great, use ARM. Uh, I guess there was just some elucid. Are there any limitations or drawbacks for using ARM that we need to keep in mind? Yeah, so some workloads aren't faster, first. Second, not all libraries are compiled for ARM. Uh, kudos to the like Conda magicians in the room or outside the room who have built most of the SciPy stack on ARM. Thank you for doing that. Uh, it also wouldn't work if you've got like custom Fortran code and a Docker image. That would require extra work. But again, most people that we see are just like Conda and PIP installing things that are ARM compatible. But some cases, five to 10% of cases, it's not an option that works. Uh, so from Josh Borrow, uh, how do you deal with large data sets stored off cloud, e.g. those on HPC systems? I presume that leads to high expenses? Yeah, I definitely wouldn't use the cloud for data not on cloud. I would recommend at that point Quantsite and Nabari. We just like say like, go use some other technology. Um, yeah, like the cloud is only cheap if you're operating close to your data. The like the 10 cent per terabyte number that I referenced, the like data egress costs uh, compared to this are 10 cents per gigabyte. So if you're on region local to data, it's extremely cheap. If at any point the data moves between anything, it's extremely expensive. The cloud is very easy to get wrong. 
which is why it's really nice to use a nice mature cloud software product like Coil, which does everything right. Too, too much? Sorry. Um, oh, actually, here's one I was going, I was actually wanting to ask something about. Can you elaborate, uh, this is from Peter Sobolowski. Uh, can you elaborate on your Docker comment? Is it just a question of spin up time versus using your environment magic? Yeah, uh, Docker's great. And if you want to like run something for the next 10 years, definitely use Docker. Docker wasn't designed for rapid evolution. So the biggest pain point is like the Docker build, Docker push iteration loop inside of development. But in terms of just raw speed, there's some challenges like Docker doesn't do parallel downloads very well. It compresses layers with old compression technology. It just wasn't designed to go fast. It was designed to be cached in a system like Kubernetes. It's designed for something that's gonna be, you're running the same system for the next 100 years. You're gonna keep them it around. Docker wasn't designed for what we do. What we do is very dynamic. It's very, I want 1,000 machines for five minutes and I want them off. And Docker wasn't designed for that. Uh, shout out actually to Modal, a really great company who does similar kinds of things. They've done a really good job of also displacing Docker and making very fast spin up times. Like Docker can definitely be improved. Uh, okay, I think, I think we've had uh, a lot of lively interaction there and I think, but I think I've covered all of okay. those. Are there any uh, last questions for Matt while we still have him here? I will also accept heckling Uh, oh, sorry, yes, I saw someone. Did you just have your hand up? Oh, oh goodness. There's uh, one more in Slack. One more in the Slack. Where I, I dislike it? Slack, personally. I used to... Oh, there it is. Yes, you're right. Okay. <clears throat> um, let's see. Uh, Carrie Barry uh, is asking, cost-optimized computing usually takes the form of serverless functions, Lambda Frigate, that shut yeah. down when not in use. You mentioned DAS clusters being left on for days, which makes one wonder if there's a similar paradigm that can be used to prevent cost overages. Um, yeah, to be clear, DAS clusters that are left on for days are actually doing work. It's very rare for us to leave things on if they're not actively working on things. Serverless functions are great. They're also very expensive. You're paying about a 4x cost premium for a service like Lambda. Uh, like, they cost a lot. To, to, they're keeping the machines on anyway, even if you're not using them, and they're charging you a premium. Lambda also tends to be bad because people don't like it because it has like, you can only have 16 gigabytes of RAM, your Docker images can be constrained. There's like a lot of pain around Lambda that we find. I'm not sure to answer the question though, I just kind of complained about Lambda. Uh, um, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I'm not sure either. If, uh, <laughs> if, if, if that was, if there is uh, any follow up from that, please uh, let us know. If you're in the room, that would be great, but there's otherwise in Slack. The blog posts, uh, heavy server, server, serverless, heavyweight serverless functions, which goes into the sort of like serverless functions category, which if you're doing large bulk computing, I think we have the best solution for, but obviously I'm somewhat biased. Okay, well, I think we're just about at time. Cool. So uh, let's thank our speaker once again.